Dorothy. Um, unfortunately, the chair can't make it today, so I'll be filling in for Councillor Mancini. Well, not once you see how I handle the processes here. <laughs> uh, so uh, do, are we still waiting for a few more to join us? No? Okay, great. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Catherine Morris. I'm going to be chairing this afternoon. Um, so I'll just start with a call to order. The Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. The municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaties signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all treaty people. So I will be relying heavily on uh, staff advice here this afternoon, but um, first order of business is the approval of the minutes of June 2nd, 2022. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Seconded by Councillor Austin, thank you. And approval of the order of business and approval of... Oh, sorry, yes, we should vote. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? It's approved then. Um, the approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions. Yes, I did. Thank you. And next, business arising out of the minutes? No? No, no business. Uh, any conflicts of interest? There are none. Motions of reconsideration, none. Rescission, none. Consideration of deferred business, none. Notices of tabled matters, none. Uh, do we have any correspondence, petitions, or delegations? There has been correspondence received for item 10.3.1 the presentation and it's been circulated to members as well and there's no petitions okay thank you so next we have um, a presentation on mind your plastics the circular economy and municipal policies around plastics and I invite Natasha Tucker to the mic Natasha is the executive director of mind your plastics All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Natasha Tucker. I'm the executive director of Mind Your Plastic. I'm here today to talk to you about the circular economy, plastic pollution, and municipal action. So who's Mind Your Plastic? Uh, so Mind Your Plastic is a registered Canadian charity. We are dedicated to solving plastic pollution in Canada. How do we do that? So we do that by creating change, by advocating for Canadian businesses to take impactful steps towards eliminating their plastic pollution footprint, uh, driving towards implementation of changes within municipal governments, uh, as well as with producers, recyclers, and consumers. And then lastly, supporting and implementing direct action programming. So this could be anything from providing educational talks to schools or businesses, as well as um, our direct action program called the Circular Economy Ambassador Program, which I'll tell you more about in a, in a moment. So first, why, why is this an issue? I, I think we all can agree that there's been a lot of talk about plastic pollution and how it affects our environment. Um, but there's some key stats that we need, to, we need to bring up front that will help support the why of why we're here. So less than 9% of plastic produced around the world is recycled. Did you know that that number's actually decreased as well because of the pandemic and all those single-use masks that we use and all of those things that are there for our health and safety? Unfortunately, they're having adverse effects on the health and safety of our environment. Uh, and by 2050, if we don't clean up our act, pun fully intended, uh, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. For a community like ours, that is devastating. Every minute, one dump truck of plastic enters the ocean. 
So obviously we need to do better. Uh, you know, no amount of cleaning up, while it's an incredible initiative and it's important and it needs to happen, with that stat of one dump trunk entering the ocean, it's never gonna happen if we don't start with the preventative side of things first. So we, we need to do better, but, but what does that look like? So first, let's talk about how it gets into the environment. Call me naive, I'd like to think that a lot of people don't drive around throwing Tim Hortons cups out their windows. Some of our uh, off-ramps may beg to differ, but nonetheless, I'd like to think that a lot of people are not doing that intentionally, and if they are, it's, it's, I would assume it's a very small percentage of people. A lot of this really comes from poor waste management practices, as well as, again, the allowance of the use of single-use plastics. Uh, so these poor waste managements can be anything from overflowing garbage cans in our communities or um, you know just people who don't know how to properly recycle and I'm, I'm very proud of Halifax's recycling system I will say that um, but nonetheless uh, improper signage or just uh, the, the community not knowing what to do with what they have uh, and then you know when those poor waste management practices are in place you know <laughs> it seems so simple but the wind uh, that carries a lot of these materials into our environment into our ocean and harming the animals that live there, and then of course affecting us as humans. Uh, not sure if you've seen the stat lately that you know all humans are having some plastic in our blood, uh, in our lungs. So that's that's pretty scary. Um, so we we clearly need to do something about this. So that's what I'm here to do today. So, uh, of course, as I mentioned, we're here to talk to you about the circular economy, um, but it's important to understand where we are right now and where we've come from. So, uh, you know, a linear economy is, is where we are right now, and to, to save, you know, economics lesson right now, just a very quick overview, uh, a linear economy is really a system that's designed on a take, make, and dispose. And I'm not going to bring you through all those various steps there, but I will draw your attention to the little clouds that say CO2 and all the various steps that go into the manufacturing of items in the take, make, dispose or linear economy method. For, for example, we'll use you know, a, a single use coffee cup. Has everyone here used a single use coffee cup lately? Perhaps, yeah, pretty common. We need to stay caffeinated. I see you, yeah, I see you. It's okay, but we have to do the best with what we can. And this isn't about shaming, it's about seeing how we can be better. Um, so if you think of that single use coffee cup, look at the life cycle it's gone through just to get there. You know, there's all these materials that have gone in just to create the materials that create the cup. And it goes through the, you know, the extraction, the addition of chemicals, uh, the transportation, and then it gets processed into your cup. And then it gets delivered to a store where it then goes you know into processing into your hand how long do you use that cup for five minutes if you're like me I nurse my coffee it takes me like two hours but still nonetheless and then we dispose of it and it doesn't ever go away uh, it ends up in our environment thus breaking down into tiny 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 little pieces called microplastics and then eventually nanoplastics not good so where we want to go is the circular economy so this is one that is focused on how we can eliminate the waste, the end of that, the disposal. So how we can really make waste a resource in itself. Um, so we are reducing the material and the resource use. Uh, we are using the waste as a resource to produce new materials and decreasing and um, perhaps very optimistically, but eliminating the creation of waste. Um, so, you know, there's many steps. I like to reference the six R's of sustainability that focus on rethink, reduce, reuse, uh, and all those various things, including repair, so that we are really looking at our products and seeing, you know, is this necessary? Do we need this? And if it's a yes, how can we continue its life instead of buying something new through that linear economy model? So bringing up the Circular Economy Ambassador Program, uh, this is a really cool program that Mind Your Plastic, and I will mention formerly known as Plastic Oceans Canada, um, we started this program last year. Uh, this was a free program for, for uh, teachers to lead in their schools. Uh, so we had about 450 students sign up for this last year, and this was across four provinces in Canada. It was our, our little pilot project, and we learned so much, but ultimately the teachers were given curriculum um, that they would bring to their classrooms designated for youth age 13 to 18. We even had a university participate as well. So we would give the curriculum aids and the teachers would you know, bring that to their classrooms with a variety of pedagogical activities. The students would then go out into the environment, whether they're near a shoreline or not, they would go, they would conduct community cleanups and then they would learn about what's in their environment. Uh, you know, the, the common one being cigarette butts, of course. Um, but nonetheless, they had this opportunity not only to go clean 
clean up garbage, right? Because cleaning up garbage is a thankless job, and as I mentioned, no cleanup is ever gonna solve this problem, but what it did do is it made them aware of the issue, first of all, and then through that, we also provided prompting questions. So why is this here? Why are there so many cigarette butts here? Why are there so many coffee cups here? What is the localized waste management issue? And then it brings them to explore the environment. Is it, are they in an area where there are t a ton of fast food restaurants? Are they in an area where there's no garbage cans prevalent at all? Uh, do they need cigarette butt uh, disposal places in their parks and areas? So, you know, it really got them thinking about why this stuff is here to begin with and what the solutions are. So aside from that, they were also tracking and analyzing what they found in the environment and submitting it to us. We have a nice database. I have a lovely team member who loves to crunch some numbers and see what is happening in which province or municipality. And then what we do with that, as we continue to add and grow to this database, we're able to then use that for policy change and see what those issues are. This year, we had a very ambitious goal. Uh, we like to recruit from spring to uh, summer because there's a lot of resources that we provide that are municipality specific to those schools that are involved. We had a goal this year of having 3,000 students, you know, but really the main goal was how can we get students involved in every single province and territory in Canada? Because the issue often ends up being very, very important to us on the coast but sometimes falls by the wayside in the prairies or those areas that don't feel connected to the issue because they're not near the oceans. I'm proud to say that as of yesterday, we have all provinces and territories signed up for the September season, which is really exciting to see, and over 3,500 students confirmed. So speaking of municipality change, you know, in terms of what we do with that data and what we're really excited to see come December once we take all the data from the students who have participated, you know, what is the municipality's role in plastic waste reduction? So a municipality's role in plastic pollution reduction, I will draw your attention to the very bottom line there that says municipalities are the change makers and leaders in plastic waste reduction. I will also take the time just to mention that as a native Nova Scotian, I'm so proud of what we've done uh, as a province um, coming from here, but bouncing around to a few different provinces in Canada through my, my life and really realizing how much of a leader we've been in terms of eliminating the single-use plastic bag very early on, as well as composting. I always thought that was normal. It's, it's not. <laughs> um, so I'm really proud to say that that's you know, the case here. Um, we have a very forward-thinking um, focus here for plastic pollution, so I'm really confident that we can make some really solid change here in HRM. Um, but really, it's through advocacy and collaboration. So. You know, we, we've spent a lot of time talking to various stakeholders and what we've really realized is that there's so many people working on this issue, but, but we're maybe not working on it together like we should be. Everyone's working in silos and that's really where Mind Your Plastic wants to have an impact is to be the connectors. We're talking to people who are producing the materials, we're talking to municipalities, we're talking to businesses and consumers. So how can we use Mind Your Plastic as a resource to combine all of that. But as a municipality, we really hope to see that happening more when, we, when it comes to plastic pollution reduction. Leadership, so taking bold action to reduce plastic pollution in your region. So, you know, even referencing Metro Vancouver's uh, recent policy to ban certain single-use plastic items ahead of the federal ban, and even adding a single-use plastic cup deposit in their, in their um, Vancouver regions. Uh, so how we can influence those in our local municipalities and take it a step further ahead of a federal ban to be a leader and to be recognized in that way. And then of course, you know, on that similar thought there, uh, policy. So making sure that businesses and residents in the municipality are partaking and understand it. Um, one thing that's been very prevalent as well is, you know, ahead of the single-use plastic ban where we know it's an issue, uh, because of a lack of guidance, not necessarily on our part specifically, but just uh, you know, Canadian-wide, is the introduction of compostables or bioplastics or um, biodegradables. And unfortunately, because of a lack of information, these have become very widespread. However, did you know? They're not actually compostable. Um, no facility in Canada, no, no municipality has the ability to properly pr dispose of those. So they end up breaking down into little tiny pieces that we talked about, those microplastics. Um, so again, that's where it's really important to have strong policy uh, surrounding those things so that we're not replacing one thing with another that could be potentially just as bad, if not worse. So of course, policy action by municipalities. There are 
amazing municipalities doing amazing things here. Um, so banning single-use plastic items, as, as I mentioned, you know, Halifax um, being a leader in that already with the single-use plastic ban. Um, maybe not the first, I believe they were the first in Manitoba to do that. Um, but again, just really taking that initiative to enact these single-use plastic policies. Um, and then plastic-free procurement strategies. So as a, you know, a transition, we've seen even a, a city, which I'll talk about in a moment here, taking steps to ban single-use plastic items just in their own internal procurement strategies. So how can we, you know, internally maybe not have single-use plastic bottles or your water cooler have cups and mugs instead of paper cups or whatever it may be as just a transition and a trial. And then an investment in public plastic-free initiatives. So for example, in London, Ontario, there are, um, during the summer months, there are um, water refill stations that are placed around the city so that people don't need to go in and buy water bottles. If they have their water bottle, they can just fill it up themselves. And then plastic-free event policies. So um, this is the main thing that I'm so excited to talk to you about today, um, in addition to the circular economy topics, um, because this is already happening in one community, only one across Canada. So with um, localized events, I'm going to use a, an example that's might hit home to some of you. So I had the amazing- You also have two minutes, sorry. All right, and go. Luckily I can talk really fast. So, um, you know, the plastic free pollution um, policies that we want to enact would be for events. So if you think of like Rib Fest, for example, that just happened, that was really cool and well done, liked it at Alderney Landing this year. But nonetheless, if you look at every single person who attended that, there is, it's all single use plastic items. Any public or any policy that includes plastic free events uh, often includes just having better items or having uh, facing recycling for consumers to put their um, their disposed items in. However, I think it's pretty prevalent with a 9%, less than 9% recycling rate. Okay, that's one in every 10 items maybe getting recycled if you do have recyclables. So what we really wanna talk about is how we can then avoid that waste. So instead of focusing on what the better alternatives are in terms of single use items, so focusing on compostable plastics, I'll say with that with quotations, um, how can we focus perhaps on reusable items instead as a first and foremost idea? So it's really about holding the event hosts accountable for that through a policy that is enacted by HRM. So this would really be making sure that they have a plan for what they're going to do, whether it's a reusable model or whether it's a bring your own model or a deposit system. There are a variety of methods here that will work um, and that the city of Ajax is currently working on right now and they're in phase three of five of their implementation. So reusable alternatives, again, as I mentioned, so there are companies out there that do that or NGOs that will own that and then be able to distribute to the events, uh, often with a fee that supports their NGO. <gasps> Two minutes or less, all right, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks very much, Natasha. Uh, and sorry I didn't give you that uh, 10 minute <laughs> deadline, I forgot to do that at the beginning, but thank you very much for the excellent presentation. And I'm just wondering if any committee members have questions. Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the presentation. Uh, I just, uh, a lot to take in in it. Um, so, I mean, I heard uh, Claire ask about procurement and um, events. Um, I was just wondering, as uh, more in the intro, I was thinking about, um, you know, do we have anything, uh, do we have any knowledge like, you know, what the state of our plastic pollution is more locally like that, you know, when we talk about like uh, more more plastic in the ocean than fish, it's a pretty dreary, dreary conclusion. And uh, I know a good, uh, around the world, it's it, there's varying degrees of pollution control. Do we have anything that's more local like uh, how we're doing here? Okay, so just waiting for the red light. Um, so when it comes to what's happening here in our local climate, there aren't specific stats on that right now because as you can imagine with the, all the tides coming in and whatnot, it can be very difficult to get a, a clear picture of that. You know, I'll even give an example of say BC. If you look at BC as a whole, it, it really depends on where you go. If you're in the Vancouver area, you're okay, you have cigarette butts and disposable cups and, and packaging, so it's not gonna be anything that's gonna, you know, uh, make you feel really connected to the issue. Of course, it's never nice to see litter, but you go up 
to the coast of say hi to Gwaii or wherever it may be or even on the, the Pacific coast of the Vancouver Island, the issue is significant there. There again, there is no amount of cleaning up that will ever clear that plastic unless we stop it and so to speak turn off the tap, that's, I'm, that's not my trademark but I wish it was, um, but turning off the tap on plastic. So you're right, it, it is um, more of a, a generalized statistic because of course often the, um, the lower income or third world countries deal with the brunt of our plastic addiction. Yeah. Um, so locally, you know, it, it's definitely not as, as dire as say, you know, in the Philippines or in Indonesia or Honduras or anywhere like that. Yeah, uh, th thank you for that. I was, that's kind of just what I was looking for. Um, you know, I think uh, it, it's tempting sometimes to excuse ourselves as, uh, because, oh, well, we're doing fine here. It's these other folks. But I mean, what is it? Where is the demand coming from in the first place? And I think we all experienced that uh, shock a little bit on the municipal end when China stopped taking all our trash back and we started having to scramble to deal with it locally. So uh, thank you for the presentation. I uh, really appreciate it. Any other questions? Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for the presentation, appreciate it. Um, I do like the idea, and, and maybe if no one's got a motion working on this, it might be great to actually get a report on um, how we could implement plastic-free mm -hmm. events at our facilities, because uh, there would be some logistical stuff as well as education with the community groups and cost. Uh, most community groups use plastic because it's cheap, uh, but I do like that idea. And in terms of local data, it's mostly anecdotal, but there are groups that actually publish when they do the cleanups of what kind of stuff they do in Literati. They track that, uh, Luke at uh, A1, one of the biggest proponents of it. Um, and it's different on land versus ocean. So on land, it's with cups, it's bags, it's that kind of stuff. In the ocean and on the beaches, it's rope, it's ghost gear, traps, plastic bait containers, that kind of stuff. And it's a massive amounts of it. Um, are you familiar, you talk about uh, the curriculum and, and the uh, resources you need, are you familiar with uh, Annie Leonard's story of stuff? It's been about 15 years, I think she started it, it might have been 15 years ago this year. Um, talking about the circular versus linear economy and uh, there, and from that, now there's a whole foundation and a board and a staff. And when she started in 2000, it was just her. Uh, and she's a materials uh, scientist. So the idea that, um, you know, we're, and they've done videos on uh, not uh, just the story of stuff in our, our cyclical economy that we should be aiming for, but the story of plastics and the story of all these other things. They're fabulous resources if you haven't uh, used them before. I, I teach and I've worked it for the last 15 years in every class I've had from productions and operations to marketing to uh, even e HR. Um, are you aware that this committee has actually tried to ban single-use plastics? I am. <laughs> uh, and you know how unsuccessful we're because of the, the provincial mandate and the fact that we're not allowed to uh, ban single-use plastics. I don't know the, the details as to why not. So as I understand it, and I don't know if we have any staff here who could speak to this later, but um, under the Department of Environment and the environmental regulations in Nova Scotia, we can regulate certain things, but when we tried to ban, uh, gosh, this would have been five, six years ago now, single-use straws and cups and that kind of stuff, uh, we don't have the authority to tell companies not to bring in or not to use those kind of products. Only the provincial and federal governments have that jurisdiction under the Constitution, and they haven't devolved any of that to us. Um, so we've tried, and unfortunately we can't. Uh, but what we can do is lead, and I really like a lot of the ideas you had in there. Um, on the events, are, do you have any specific recommendations for the types of policies we could implement? Or you said Ajax is bringing something like this in. I used to live in Pickering and Ajax. Uh, great community. Uh, is there anything that we should be considering when we bring in such a policy? Uh, if, if no one's done it yet, I don't know if there are any lessons are learned or if there's anything we could take away from that, but do you have any thoughts on how we could actually implement it? Absolutely, thank you for the question. Um, there are some resources that were distributed as well, so um, you know some ideas in terms of how you would implement. And of course, there's there's going to be challenges. We know that significantly. You know, we, we consider cost. Um, even one thing that we looked at was the cost per you know solo cup, disposable solo cup, which is about 14 cents per cup. But even there's there's rental companies. If if we don't want to hold them ourselves as our own resources. Um, 
um, as one of those models. Uh, you know, even to rent these cups through an organization, it's 25 cents a cup. I think it works out to be um, $50 or something for, for X amount of cups, and the statistics specifically are escaping me. Um, but even that includes the washing and the return and everything. So, you know, I think an extra 10 cents could be significant when you're using it and applying it to thousands of people. But I, I think it's it's really important to be leaders in that space because if you have X amount of people, and I even um, the example I've been using most frequently when talking about this policy was uh, the FCM conference in Regina a few weeks, a month ago. Uh, I had the pleasure of attending that, and what blew me away was that facility with single-use plastic everywhere. If you think that that event held how many people? About 2,000. Every single person probably used at least three cups, coffee, maybe another coffee, a water, maybe a beer. Every single person used that over a three-day minimum span. That's massive. And if you consider one in 10 of that was recycled, if that. Um, so there, there's a significant change that needs to happen here. So yes, cost is going to be something that needs to be overcome, but that needs to be taken on by the event hosts. And again, the, the rental system is one way. Uh, there's, again, we can look at a bring your own system. I've been to many events where you bring your own cup and even perhaps get a discount, right? Um, or even using community groups, or again, as I mentioned, NGOs. There's an NGO, um, Ecology North that is doing this on a smaller scale. They, ha they ha hold about 200, you know, plates, bowls, cutlery, all of that. So for smaller municipal events, and even there's a community in Grossmore, Newfoundland, trying this as well, um, of hosting that and holding that as a nonprofit. And then when the events hold uh, hold the events there, sorry, I said events like a million times, um, but when they have those, uh, then they just pay a fee to the uh, the NGO. They get exposure and they get that as a donation for them, and they take care of the holding and the reimbursement. And then you can also do a deposit style system as well, right? So you're still getting some money back if people do end up keeping the cups, but more often than not, they just return it and then you deal with the sanitization of it. So this is becoming more and more popular. Um, we've even seen many larger, um, you know, organizations, for example, Tim Hortons or Burger King in the US trying, um, reusable systems in their stores. So that means that this type of stuff is becoming more widespread in the sense of there will be organizations that have massive amounts of reusable items that will be able to rent it out for these events. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Those were excellent policy suggestions. We appreciate you coming in this afternoon to meet with us. Sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, Kathy. I couldn't see your light there. Sorry, please go ahead. Councillor Dave. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Natasha. I could listen to you for hours. You have a wonderful way of speaking and uh, sort of bringing to life a very complicated issue in a lot of ways. So um, thank you. Um, I had the occasion to know somebody that, I don't know, maybe it was 10, 15 years ago that was up north at the North Pole on a scientific expedition, and they were talking about the flushing of the Earth from the North Pole to the South Pole and the South Pole back up to the North Pole. And they were actually studying, I think it was like 15, 16 years ago, and they were actually studying the effect of plastics in the water that was coming around and stuff. So it was almost, their work was trying to let the world know that it is everybody's problem because of the way that the earth flushes, that we all own what's happening uh, in our oceans and what's happening in plastic. So it brought it back to life. Um, I would love to introduce you to a now 12 year old, uh, Eva Goss, who is from Lake Egmont. And last year in 2021, she won the UK Young Scientists Award and she created, um, a, it was called the Cleaner Picker Upper. She drew this, it would go along the ocean floor, pick up uh, the plastics, and there is a, let me see, I'm gonna find this because it was so cool. And um, see the cleaner, so Jean de Clarier, the maker, he's actually a, a nuclear physicist that's actually gonna build this for her. And so it's coming in through, um, yeah, let me find this. 
There is a video that's being made by the little inventors of the cleaner picker upper for an exhibition that's based on Ava, the little inventors, and his video conference and interview with her. That's actually coming up pretty soon. So um, I would love to introduce you to Ava. She is incredible. And I think the program that you spoke about with students and with young people, there are genius out there. And you know, when I met Ava at 11 years old, and then making a connection, it was just, it was phenomenal. So um, congratulations and whatever we can do to actually support that part of what's happening with minor plastics, I would love to be able to be involved in that. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Oh, oh just wanted to say thank you so much. And if anyone wants to listen to me talk about plastic pollution, I will happily do that for hours. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? No? Okay, thanks again. Thanks so much for coming in this afternoon. So next on the agenda, we have our naturalization strategy and staff will be providing a staff presentation. And it's, uh, do we do the motion ahead or do we have the presentation first? Presentation, yeah, okay, thank you. and members of the committee. My name is Richard Harvey. I'm the manager of policy and planning. I'm pleased to be here this afternoon to provide you with an overview of the staff report you have in your package uh, considering the naturalization strategy. The origin of this project really stems from a February 21st, 2017 regional council motion uh, that requested a staff report on the possibility of a park naturalization strategy uh, through this particular committee. Now, essentially naturalization is an ecologically based approach to landscape management that seeks to enhance biodiversity and ecological resilience in the urban landscape using native or non-invasive adapted plant species. In response to the 2017 motion of Regional Council, staff recommended a series of naturalization initiatives approved by Regional Council on January 29th, 2019, that included a two-year pilot program to initiate various naturalization initiatives on three sites. Now, prior to the 2019 report, there had been a series of one-off, if you like, um, approaches to naturalization or projects um, but this more so represented uh, something of a uh, coordinated approach. Now, the two-year pilot project was interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic, delaying and altering the approaches for implementation. On March 23rd, 2021, 20, uh, Regional Council approved a project, a pilot project extension with the intention of having staff return to Regional Council to report on the overall successes and challenges of the initiative. Um, uh, noting that it required resources and making recommendations on the future implementation of an actual naturalization strategy. So just by way of presentation, I'd like to give you something of a pictorial overview of some of the projects uh, which have been undertaken, uh, starting first with Leighton Dillman Park. Uh, this is an area that was formerly managed as turf and was repurposed as a pollinator me uh, meadow. Uh, this process was led by staff in the spring of 2021. Plantings in this area include ongoing wildflower seedings, pagoda dogwood trees, butterfly bush, and summer sweet shrubs. Merv Sullivan Park is another example of a naturalization initiative as a pilot program. This is a former grass area which was repurposed as, plant, as a planted gathering space. Felled urban trees placed by staff for seeding, soil and mulching for planting were all included. Community volunteers were involved in planting service berries, sweet ferns, bear berries, uh, bee balm, and swamp milkweed. As you can very much see from these images, the type of involvement of both the community and staff. 
Simi Court uh, right of way is an area that alongside a street that was formerly a grass road, sho uh, road shoulder. And uh, the intention here was of creating a planted community space in the community. The project was resident led, proving a good example of, of a, a particular project that uh, came to staff uh, and involved the community in, in site planting and preparation. More than 2,000 perennials were grown, donated, and planted directly by community volunteers. Now, given the fact that this has been a pilot program, the purpose of this report is to outline some of the successes and challenges. Staff have uh, compiled more than 30 sites with naturalization potential uh, that have been suggested by both the public and staff. There are also regular community requests to plant trees on municipal lands and recently several requests to create butterfly gardens in parks. Relationships have also been developed with partners such as the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute, Tree Canada, and Dalhousie University. Researchers at Dalhousie are collaborating with the municipality regarding the urban forest on an ongoing basis. These types of partnerships allow for resource and knowledge sharing and strengthen our naturalization efforts. Now a challenging aspect of the naturalization program have been demands for staff resources uh, really to implement the project and coordinate the increasing interests of the public and other stakeholders. Staffing and project resources during the pilot time frame uh, have not been dedicated to the program but rather shared between different business units and staff responsibilities. So it really is an interdepartmental initiative. Now the interest and success in the naturalization projects have led to a conclusion that a permanent naturalization program should be considered, along with dedicated staff and resources, especially if we wish to maximize the scale and impact of naturalization. While community involvement is an important aspect of the naturalization program, volunteers do tend to ebb and flow. Two seasonal gardeners would also be involved with the municipal projects uh, that are labor intensive during the first few years until plants are established. Having knowledgeable staff working with community members on the ground would also improve planting, su planting success rates. Associated with the staffing, long-term dedicated fund, funds for plantings and other related materials would also be needed to be allocated. A three-year funding allocation for plantings and related materials has been identified as detailed in the financial implications of the report. Now, one of the possible outcomes of the naturalization program as a pilot was envisioned to be a strategy. At this time, such a fulsome strategy is only envisioned with the implementation of, of further community-based naturalization and additional corporate initiatives, such as those that have been identified within the report. Such a strategy would be expected to address how the municipality might further institute and prioritize naturalization projects. Due to the specific set of naturalization deliverables identified, a strategy is not seen as a necessary outcome to advance the resourcing that is recommended in the report. On that basis, you have the recommendation in front of you, which involves that the, sustain that the Environment and Sustainable Standing Committee recommend that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to allocate staff resources through the 2023-24 budget and the business planning process to create an expanded uh, municipal-wide naturalization program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard, for the presentation. Um, I guess we'll go to questions. Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Richard and company, for all the work in this. Uh, I, I guess I should start with the motion. I move that Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee recommend that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to expand the naturalization pilot to a municipal-wide program and include 150000 in the 2023-24 operating budget for Regional Council's consideration to support the program. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Lovelace. I'm sorry, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. <laughs> uh, many hats over there. <laughs> um, so I, th 
I appreciate all the work that's gone into this and when I think about some of the things that uh, I know is also churning away in parks that I think will be complementary to this is the whole um, idea of a, a parks advisory committee um, and a, a stewardship program to more full, uh, have a more fulsome approach to involving the public in our parks. I think those would actually, when they come forward, if they come in the way that I'm hoping to see them, um, they would dovetail very nicely with the naturalization in terms of involving the public. Um, the only question I have is just on the recommendation uh, that we don't need a strategy. And, um, you know, I, I'm kind of fine with the idea of like, well, let's just get on with the doing, um, Im start implementing. Are we losing anything though without having that overall, well, this is what we want to achieve versus having more of a responsive program that is aimed at, well, let, let, let's, let's go plant some stuff out there. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, to, for the question. I think what we've uncovered, I, I think more than anything else, is that at least in terms of a fulsome strategy of how it is that we undertake this, would be far better served uh, with uh, more projects advanced through the uh, through the actual implementation of the program itself. So it's it's not to say that we haven't developed, if you like, priorities or where it is the planting should be occurring. It's not uh, you know it's not a uh, a sort of a random uh, matter. It's just that we have uh, fully observed that at least a fulsome strategy would, would be more so beneficial uh, with a program in place. Okay, uh, so would one of the objectives of a strategy, or is it something we're thinking about now? Like I'm thinking. Um, if we're going to commit some staff to this um, and uh, grow this into a more, uh, into a, you know, less of an ad hoc program, do we have some ideas as to what we would want in terms of desired outcomes and in, in like, I, I'm, I'm thinking like, okay, so we, we commit these resources and we're going to see a dozen, a dozen different projects happen then. Like, have we given any kind of thought as to, well, if we put these people in place, what are we actually going to get out on the output end? Yeah, so certainly through to the councillor. The, um, I, I think so. The, the important thing that has been highlighted in, in, the, uh, in the staff report through the pilot program and the examples are, for example, areas with steep uh, banks, you know, areas where we uh, believe that naturalization is even a better fit than, for example, turf grass or other means. So there are already examples, if you like, uh, which would include even areas such as certain boulevards or otherwise, uh, where we know that these are uh, good fits in terms of the program. It's really just the overall strategy then building upon this that might result in guidelines, they might in result in uh, identifying the various circumstances uh, that uh, overall staff would then be able to, or even council and the public would be able to say this fits within a certain program. It's, it's really how those would actually develop in many ways. Okay, uh, well, I, I'm good to see this move forward with some uh, additional resources behind it. It's something I think that uh, it ticks so many different boxes um, out there. Um, it's, I would love to see the shore of Lake Banook be uh, less knotweed and more naturalized. So uh, thank you for all the work on this. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's nice to see you up there today. <laughs> And thank you, uh, Richard, for this presentation. Uh, I'm really happy to see this moving forward. Uh, the, um, my personal experience uh, with the Syme Court ROW in Hammonds Plains uh, was quite amazing. To see the community come together and excited about this project. Uh, this was just an ROW that the neighbors were mowing. Uh, for years and they came together and said let's just plant a butterfly garden let's plant a boulevard garden and it was wonderful it really brought the community together all ages were in there digging and planting um, lots of donations came in in fact too many uh, plants were donated we didn't know what to do with them um, it was amazing but uh, now there's a bench 
there's an outdoor library. Uh, it is a spot where kids are spending time together with their grandparents. Families are having fun in this garden. Um, you know, I do think that we need to uh, uh, spend some resources here. Absolutely, Richard, I agree. Uh, $150,000, though, I, I, I don't quite understand what we'll be getting from that. I'm, I'm just wondering if you can speak to how you came to that amount. But we do need to ease the, ease the process. Uh, for the communities to be able to uh, create these initiatives and to be able to create these gardens in their communities. Uh, I was just speaking with um, a woman of Asian descent who said, we would love to have a Chinese garden with uh, some plants and herbs that um, reflect their culture. And, uh, and certainly there's lots of opportunities to engage uh, different communities uh, throughout the municipality to think about ways that we can create a much more, um, you know, uh, smarter use of this space. So the educational opportunities here, the stewardship program, awesome, 100% I'm behind this. What I think we might be missing out on is having the policy that we need, such as an MOU with Halifax Water and an MOU with the province. Looking back a few years ago and how difficult it was to create a community garden along a provincial roadway in St. Margaret's Bay, uh, actually Upper Tantallon, uh, it almost stopped the process completely. And this is a community garden where each year food is harvested for the St. Margaret's Bay Food Bank. Valuable resource for the community. Wonderful community building initiative. Uh, but it almost didn't happen because it was on a provincial right away. So I'm wondering if you can also speak to how we can work better with our provincial partners and Halifax Water, in particular, the Syme Court and Hamas Plains ROW. We had a lot of issues uh, working with Halifax Water on that, uh, as you know, Richard. So, um, yeah, I think there's lots of opportunities here, and I love the opportunity of having cultural community gardens as well and think about ways that we can increase that diversity uh, and reflect the communities that we serve. Thank you so much. So just through to the councillor, I mean, essentially with the pilot project, what we've been doing is, is very well, um, but in an interdepartmental approach with um, some, you know, this really being a sort of a parks and rec sort of leadership, uh, we've been doing it, if you like, a little bit at the side of the desk. Mm -hmm. We've been doing it, you know, uh, with, you know, I wouldn't say cobbling together, but we've been taking people out of their regular resources, uh, you know, in a collective way to implement these projects as pilots. R recognizing that that's not sustainable, it's not, it's not providing the right degree of um, responsibilities, leaderships, even to undertake the very types of things that you're, that you're speaking of. We certainly wouldn't have the staff resources to mm -hmm. commence those types of discussions. So what's the recommendation that's in the staff report uh, isn't with regards to planting materials or, or otherwise, it's really what you'd be deciding uh, to recommend as a committee are the staffing resources that would be dedicated to the program. Uh, that would be one staff uh, full-time equivalent along with seasonal gardeners, which would be responsible for other things. So those types of initiatives, you know, as both taken on in terms of the position or as subsequently recommended by council, uh, would be, you know, like would be going to that position, which also would have the same support it's envisioned from an interdepartmental and within the department itself. So it's really the staffing resource that would be, um, that would that would be the the outcome of the of the motion. And the MOU. Well, all of those things, yes, all of those things would be outcomes of this, uh, as you okay. would direct. Okay, thank you, and Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Richard. Um, in your presentation, you answered a little bit of my question um, when you talked about in the financial piece, uh, financial implications, because I was trying to connect the motion, which is for one year, that would that be within the regular operating budget, or will we end up seeing that as an over when we get to budget conversations? Um, and to, to start a project like this, is there a risk then? And then you identified that it was the climate capital fund that the three-year funding would come through. So could this current motion, is that is that the fund that we would use for this $150,000? 
um, or is it in the operating budget? So thank you, through, through the chair, there's really two parts to this in many ways, or at least the, the, the what, you'd, what you'd be doing is recommending the staffing resources to then be considered through the budget process. So, you know, as we would do every year, we're, we're essentially, or what council would ultimately be doing, are identifying to the chief administrative officer resources, positions, whatever is, is identified by council ultimately as a priority to be considered through the budget. When you receive that budget, you may make other decisions at that time. You may decide, hmm, on the balance of other priorities or otherwise, we actually do not want to advance this. But what this recommendation does would be to indicate to the chief administrative officer this would be something of a priority for those discussions at that time. So that's the operating bit. That's the, the operating part of that. The, uh, the plantings themselves are not included within that, if you like, $150,000 that have been earmarked as a, or as a, as a staff resource. But we have, uh, through these climate funds, identified that we have the funding in place for three years for the plantings that have been envisioned. It is also fair to say that once you go beyond that particular point in time, we would then be having to bring, as part of that, you know, subsequent operating uh, budgets within, let us say, four years, we would have to start bringing in some of the uh, budget numbers for those planting materials, depending upon the success of the program, the initiatives that are undertaken. There are, of course, other partners that we would be looking for in terms of plantings. Some of these, as, uh, as your colleagues indicated, sometimes comes from the community themselves. So we, we, we don't know at that stage, we, 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 but those would be things that the coordinator would all be looking uh, into. So it might not come as an over. <laughs> Short version. <laughs> it, 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 it should be, if I'm not mistaken, right. rolled into the reg. You would see okay. this as a line item Yes. Um, within the within the upcoming budget, and you would then be able to identify it and okay. say this is an outcome of the you know of the of the Great. recommendation of the committee and and the okay. approval if it's granted by council. Thank you. I, I do support it. Um, my last quick question: uh, Village Green Land in Appendix B is that the Waverly Green? I'd have to get back to you separately on okay. that. Just just for clarification, not as familiar with the list to be honest with you. Thanks. Thank you, and if it's okay with the committee, I'd like to ask a few questions myself from the chair. Um, could, could you talk a little bit about how sites will be selected? You, you mentioned a bit about um, steep slopes and boulevards. Uh, how else will sites be selected? In the absence of an overall strategy, I'm wondering how you're gonna determine those other locations, please. There's, I think, two aspects to this. There's one where the municipality and the staff are identifying that certain sites, municipal sites, which are not necessarily coming as a result of community interest, can actually you know, serve these purposes. So uh, our park staff, as they are looking at, even for example, difficult slopes, or looking at things saying, I wonder why we have turf there. Why do we, you know, why do we, why do we manage it in that particular way? Uh, would be as those types of circumstance arose, uh, identifying those. Um, I think it's also fair to say that those would still be, if you like, not the pilot projects, but we would continue to look at those areas almost in, as experiments to see how they go, to see how they take, where are the right places. The same would be true of boulevard areas. As we mentioned earlier, these have happened uh, sometimes independently, uh, again, of this particular pilot program. So the staff will always be looking at these areas and saying, where can these be, where can these best be implemented? There may be suggestions from council, there may be uh, of councillors or even the public. The second aspect of this is more so the community initiatives, which have been partly, uh, if you like, pardon the pun, cultivated both by community members and staff. There have been areas that have been identified sometimes within parkland, uh, where we know there's been a, a slight bit of community interest that, the, that has then been fostered, or there have been places that have, or there have been situations where staff of the municipality have been approached, and we would suggest those continue to, will, those will continue to occur, and that's essentially how it is that, that I think this would continue uh, to be developed as a, as a program. Okay, thank you. And that's all the questions. 
Thank you very much for the presentation. So um, the motion's on the floor. Oh, sorry, uh, Richard. Just, just for clarification, the, um, the recommendation that was flashed up in the presentation differs from the one that you've read. The one that you've read is the correct one. So I just wanted to just, just cover that off and just say we'll correct that in the, in the ongoing future. And it also just probably addresses why uh, Josh, as your solicitor, was just doing a quick uh, chat and maybe in the beginning of this, but I just want to clarify that off. No, good, okay. Good, thank you. Okay, are we ready? Uh, to, okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. So we're gonna move on to item 12.1.2, yellow floating heart control, Little Albro Lake. Uh, Councillor Austin, would you like to put this motion on the floor as well? Sure. Uh, I move that the Environment and uh, Sustainability Standing Committee recommend that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrator's Officer to one, end the usage of benthic mats to control the yellow floating heart in Little Alboro Lake based on the results of the testing completed in the 2021 pilot study, and two, prepare and submit an application for special approval from Health Canada to use Procella Quartum, a selective herbicide for a pilot study to control invasive yellow floating heart in Little Alboro Lake contingent on regulatory approval by Nova Scotia Environment and Climate Change and Environment and Climate Change Canada. Discussions with all relevant government agencies in consultation with concerned stakeholders. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Thank you. Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I, well, reading this report, uh, I actually, I was quite excited by it because it's like, hey, we're, we're, we're doing primary science. There'll be other people that are gonna be looking for, what do I do with my yellow floating heart? And actually we have followed quite a process to uh, try and identify what, what, what works here in Halifax. And so I, I mean, I, I get a little bit of a thrill out of that. Um, I, I support the recommendation and it's, uh, you know, for me, the difference is like, I'm not wild about using herbicides out there in the environment. Um, and certainly like when we were talking about doing that at Lake Banook um, a few years ago, there was some suggestion of using that to control the weeds there. Uh, I thoroughly would not support that because those are native weeds that are growing and doing their thing as the mother nature intended. The difference here is yellow floating heart is not supposed to be in Little Alboro Lake. And if you go to that lake, it's almost nothing but a little flo uh, yellow floating heart uh, pond at this point, right? It's it totally taken over and is uh, very much degrading the natural environment. And the conversations I've had with residents there over the last six years, um, I very much expect that they will be on board with the idea of using a herbicide there because they're just at their wit's end for what's happened to their lake. And the big fear for all of us is that it stops being a little uh, Albro problem and becomes a big Albro problem a Banook problem, a Micmac problem, um, as it uh, potentially could spread out of this lake. So I, I support the recommendation. Um, and I have a couple of questions. Um, my first would be, uh, the study in Oklahoma indicated f it was fairly effective with the first round of the of the spray that was done. Um, when we apply, because of course uh, I've been to the lake when the seeds are there, and like literally you can just scoop them up. They're so thick the float the number of floating seeds on the shore. I'm expecting that if we if we were successful in getting this, we would probably have to go back to the lake more than once. Would our would is that what the approval we'd be seeking from the province? and the feds with uh, like, ideally we'd have permission to do this over a couple of seasons because I suspect it's not gonna be a one shot and then problems are over. Hi, um, thanks, Councilor Austin. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Montgomery. I'm the water resource specialist um, on the environment and climate change team. Um, just to answer your question, so the study in Oklahoma um, was a much larger affected area. And um, as far as the seeds go, so the approval for this is a one year permit. And if it extends past one year, we would have to reapply and justify the reapplication like process with that paperwork with Health Canada. 
Um, so, but because it's such a small study area, the timing of the pesticide application would try and prevent the seeds being released. And so ideally it would be applied like early enough in the season that it would just be a one-time application. And it's such a small water body that based on the research that um, we've done, it looks possible that one application may be enough to then control manually um, if it were to come back in a small number or a small population after. So, uh, I mean, just n knowing the pace that things move, should there not be, uh, like, would you come back to council if you get approval to do this? Okay, because I mean, to me, uh, I like what you're saying there. Like, um, if if we did this once, and then there's going to be manual follow up in places where it pops up, because uh, just from my time in gardening, I can't imagine that it's going to be like one one go around is going to take care of this problem. So, th would that be something then that would be in when you return to council? Sorry. Yes. Yes, it would. So we this initial scope. Um, like we, because the pesticide that we're recommending specifically um, is applied by the developer of the pest of the chemical, so we they would be the ones assessing like the frequency of the application and the timing of it. But when we get through the if and when we get through the approval process, that's when we would be coming back with a more detailed plan and we would be able to answer questions about like whether or not it would need subsequent approval or uh, applications, or if it could just be done one time and then follow up with a different strategy. Um, to just reduce the amount of pesticide that's being used because it's such a residential area. Okay. I have two more questions, but I see I've burned through all my time, so I will circle back. Thank you. Uh, next is Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks so much for this. Uh, this is a lot of work. <laughs> um, and on that note, similar to what uh, Councillor Austin uh, was asking with regards to timing and reapplication um, and monitoring, uh, what if, if we're not successful in receiving approvals uh, and uh, you know we because I'm just trying to think there is no other place in the province where this has been done so you know here we are leading the way with this what happens if they refuse or what happens if one order of government refuses um, are there any other opportunities to um, to move forward? Is there, is there an appeal process? I'm just wondering what the logistics are for this. Thank you. So the recommendation in this report is to pursue emergency use um, approval from the government. The active ingredient in the chemical Priscilla that we're recommending is um, up for approval with Health, Health Canada just as a pesticide that can be applied just following the regular government approval procedure. So if the recommendation that we're making now to apply for this emergency use um, application or approval is denied, we can wait it out. And okay. because I do, I can't speculate um, whether or not Health Canada will approve this chemical, but it has been used safely and extensively in the States. And we do tend to just be a couple years behind them with our approvals. So that would be okay. the first order of business would be to reevaluate, see if there's any other options if this were not to be approved other than this chemical. But there is a, I think, good chance that it will be approved. And then once it has been approved by Health Canada, we can just follow the regular approval procedures, which are a lot less onerous. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. I'm good. Thank you. And Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I actually think the Deputy Mayor asked my question and you answered it, but um, I, I get, just to reaffirm, the permit approvals, they'll require, so where the pesticide um, is coming to Regional Council, that report. And so in terms of the flow of how this happens, um, would we ask for an exemption on the current pesticide bylaw if it doesn't get changed at regional council? Yes. Yes, yes we would. Great. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. A more quick one. When we say that there's a, a medium risk that the federal government may or may not allow, how how does how do you determine medium risk? I'm just curious about that. Um, thank you, Councillor. I determined it because they that we've had informal discussions with government staffers that indicated they were, they were amenable to considering it, but we Health Canada doesn't comment on applications okay. that have not been submitted. So I ran the middle. Really, I made an educated guess. Great, thank you. <laughs> 
Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the other two things, I mean, I guess one one is mainly a point. Um, you know, uh, I think the uh, report, uh, I, I get the reasons for recommending this versus the mats. Um, the mats, the mat though, I mean, uh, I think maybe we're a little hard on it. I mean, they are labor intensive. There is an effect on the bottom, um, but the non-permeable ones did work in terms of preventing the growth in that areas. Now, compared to the pesticide, it's obviously way more work, way more chances for it not to work. Um, I, so I get why we're pursuing the other one, but uh, as terms of uh, a very expensive, very labor intensive option that's still in the back pocket. I wouldn't throw it out uh, as unsuccessful just yet. Um, then the other thing I did that I wanted to ask about is the reintroduction of native vegetation because the Dow report talked about you kill off all this floating yellow heart and now you're opening up this niche in the ecosystem and uh, you, you could end up with a lot of algae um, filling that void. So I'm wondering if, if as part of this, whether we have any thought as to uh, trying to spur on the process of native species recolonizing Little Alboro Lake where they've basically been outcompeted and pushed out of existence there. Uh, thanks, Councillor. Um, yes, so that recommendation is something we've definitely discussed and would be part of the follow-up report that came, you know, whether, depending on what happens with the Jeez, approval process. All my process. questions are right down the road, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, yes, but that is definitely something we would consider because, you you know, if you just empty this pond out and don't plant anything back in, um, obviously we just are opening it up to other invasive plants or the resurgence of this plant or, you know, like you said, blue-green algae or other types of pond weed. Um, so, and we would be looking to focus on native species in line with the naturalization strategy that was just presented. Um, but that would be, that is, that planning is based on the approval process that we are about to engage in, hopefully. Okay. Uh, well, that's the end of my questions. I really want to thank you folks for all the work. I mean, uh, it's, this has been an issue up in that lake since the early 2000s, and we've come so far from the initial instructions that residents got from the province way back in the day, which was, oh, it's too bad about your lake. Don't spread it around, please. So thank you so much for this. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Austin. Any further questions? All right. Ready for the question? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shannon and Elizabeth, for your work on this project. So next up is 12.1.3. Uh, um, this is being deferred, and I think I may have missed this earlier on. Do we need to? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, could we have that motion to defer, please? Seconded by Councillor Austin, thank you. All those in favor to defer? Any opposed? And that motion carries, thank you. So on to committee reports, we have none. Members of standing committee, none. Any motions? From Committee members? I don't see any, so um, now it's time for us to go in camera. Can I have a motion to go in camera? Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and thank you for seconding Council of Austin. So we'll go in camera then for the next part of the meeting.
you've got the, um, the acoustic panels up there, whereas this is actually higher. Resistance. so exciting and no one's coming back. Okay, uh, could, um, could someone finally read the motion uh, approving our appointments from in camera? Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Uh, so I move that the Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee one, adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential staff report dated May 25th, 2022, and two, direct that the staff report dated May 25th, 2022 be maintained as private and confidential. <laughs> Seconded by Councillor Get Jacob yourself Gammon. in minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Question. Question. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Motion carries. Thank you. So added items. No. Nope. Uh, notices of motion. Committee members? No. Nope. Uh, public participation? No registered speakers. And so the... Yes. <laughs> I love calling three times. Uh, and the date of our next meeting is September 1st, 2022. Uh, as of now, anyway, that may change. So We also forgot one second to ratify the in-camera minutes in public as well. So you just have oh. to vote on those. Okay. Right. I'm sorry. Yes. Could we then vote on the motion in 14.2? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Yeah. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, thank you. Um, and 14.1, the minutes that we approved in camera. Moved by Councillor Cleary, seconded by Councillor Dago Gammon. Okay. Question? All those in favor? All right, motion carries. All right, are we good? Move to adjourn, Move to adjourn by Councillor Cleary. Thanks, everyone.